Hi, my name is Scott McLeod. I'm a cartoonist and author, probably best known for my book Understanding Comics. I'm fascinated by technology. I'm fascinated by how comics works. I'm very much a formalist. I like taking comics apart, putting it back together. My father was an engineer in a lot of ways. I'm that kind of artist. My father was chief engineer at Raytheon's Missile Systems Division. He was blind. But despite his handicap, he managed to graduate Harvard and, and get this job and rise up the ranks at Raytheon. He actually held patents on guidance systems for things like the Patriot missile. I think my dad was a little OCD. Looking back, I remember some ticks. I remember little things that he would do that I find myself doing. I've definitely, I have, I've inherited that, I think. There was a family joke that they had me in part because uh, with three kids, the dinner table was a little unbalanced. And with four kids, it was a nice symmetrical match. And this was, this was a joke. But looking back on it now, I realize that that may actually be literally true. That I might be, I might, my entire existence might be due to an OCD tick. He was very smart, he was funny, great conversationalist. I liked him a lot and he died when I was 21, actually, I think. Because I hadn't had my birthday yet. Comics was brought into my life mostly by my friend Kurt Busick, who also makes comics today. We were in uh, middle school together, and he, after a lot of resistance for me, got me to try his stacks of comics, and I became obsessed. And about a year after I started reading them, I decided I was going to make them. It was a genuine obsession, almost to an unhealthy level. It was all I wanted to think about. The first four months that I was drawing pictures of comic book characters, I was measuring my progress as an artist and it was going up and up and they were getting better, I was getting better. And I was determined that that curve was going to, was going to keep going like that. As a young artist, I had a lot of different influences. I started out reading superhero comics and, and checking out stuff like that. And I got a little bit more unconventional with some of my superhero artist choices. People like Jim Steranko, Neil Adams. But before long, a lot of other things flooded in. First there was the American independent stuff, like Cerebus, like ElfQuest, that became very important to me. Then I started digging through history, I discovered early stuff like the spirit. Then suddenly it was Europe and heavy metal came in and brought a lot of that stuff to us. So late in high school and in college I was reading a lot of European comics, things by Drier, and Kaza, Mobius. I applied to Syracuse University in the illustration program. And then I saw just a couple of manga, and I became fascinated by manga, but I only had a couple of examples in college. The very first time, I think, I went to a movie on campus, there was a girl, a freshman like me, sitting cross-legged on the counter, taking tickets. And that was Ivy, and uh, I liked her instantly. I, I didn't move particularly fast in those days, um, so she was otherwise engaged for much of college. But I realized right before she went off to England to study abroad that I was in love with her, and I stayed in love with her for seven years. Near the end of senior year, I had a design class that had us design a resume. And as part of the assignment, they said, you have to send it to somebody that you might want to work for. I sent it to DC Comics production department because I knew they were expanding. And I thought, well, who knows, maybe. And I got the job. Moved to Manhattan, two and a half blocks away, was Books Kino Kania that had thousands and thousands of untranslated manga. I was coming home with like stacks of this stuff. And I would go to, to the DC offices and I would go up to editors and just say, look, I would like show them exactly what they were doing in manga. And, and they told me flat out that it was a cultural thing. American audiences would never go for this. Nobody would ever be interested in them. It was manga, actually, that was driving me forward. A lot of ideas for storytelling that I had gotten from reading manga started to work their way into my comics. If you look here, okay, you see that? You see these lines, that whole thing? That's very manga. The idea of what I was calling subjective motion was that Rather than just have an object with lines behind it saying that it's moving, what you really want is you want the whole world to feel like it's moving. And then that makes it feel more like you are the moving object. My father died uh, right after I got settled in Manhattan uh, from a uh, fall down staircase. 
you know, the, the important thing about this for me was two things. One was that I felt like it was in a, in a melodramatic comic book kind of a way, it felt entirely fitting and appropriate that, his, that the thing which he had struggled against all his life had, had the privilege of escorting him out of it. Do you know what I mean? It's just like that it was his blindness was clearly at fault seemed weirdly appropriate and respectful. The Fantastic Four, if they're going to die, it's not going to be at the hands of, of, of the Mole Man. It's going to be Doctor Doom, right? It's weird. I mean, like, it's not, it's, but the other thing, I, that seems very strange, but, but, but there was, <sighs> looking at his life, I realized that I admired it as a work of art. He was not an aesthetic person, but his life had an aesthetic shape to it. And the way he lived had a kind of solidity and stability and simplicity to it that felt, that felt artistic. It made it a complete work. And, and the cover just closed early. I was contemplating the slow path to success in comics before my father died. It looked like it might take me years before I could maybe make my own comic at DC. And when he died, I just decided, no, I'm, I'm going to make my own comic sooner. In a year and a half, I had it. Sent it out to four publishers, Eclipse Comics, First Comics, Pacific Comics, and Warp Graphics, which was basically ElfQuest and one or two other things. And all of them did express some interest. I had actually brought that proposal to DC because I felt like it being my employer, I kind of owed them. It was like my alma mater to at least show them first. But I knew in the back of my head that there was no way that they would give me what I needed, which was the rights to control and to own that character. By then, I think a lot of us knew the story of people like Siegel and Schuster and how they were cheated out of their own creations. It was part of the legend. It was part of, part of the lore of fandom that the people who created the most valuable properties in comics weren't necessarily the people who benefited from them. One of the appeals for Eclipse Comics, for me, strangely enough, was they could publish it sooner. And I was, I was a little weird in those days. I guess I'm still a little weird, but I actually had a fear that there would be a nuclear war and my first comic would never get published. And, and so it was a real plus that they could publish sooner. I thought if you asked me then, if you asked me now, I would say that it's, it's about as likely as not that, that the human race is not going to make it another century. But if that's true, then what rational response can you have except to focus on the remaining piece of the pie? And the key to concentrating on that, that small chance was to concentrate on all of the imagination, all of the you know, fertile ideas that people had had for over a century for how that future might come about. The idea of Zot was really about these two worlds. You have this character, this blonde boy superhero that feels like he's from another era, because he is, because he's from the far-flung future of 1965. He comes from this world in which all of the old ideas for the future that we had in the, the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, everything from Jules Verne up to, to uh, you know, Disney's Carousel of Progress, all of this stuff came true. It's all there. And so it's like this, this collection of utopias. And I wanted to show the contrast between the ideals of Zot's world and the real world um, characterized by, by the character Jenny that becomes very important to Zot. They fall in love over time. Jenny started talking Ivy, I think, around issue 13 or so, maybe issue 12. I remember I was at this party uh, during the holidays, and this was before she knew that, I, that I, I loved her. And I remember I was apologizing for maybe the second or third time that I had not brought a gift because I really should have brought a gift for, 
for her birthday. And from the other side of the room, she said, shut up, smiled and winked at me. <laughs> and, and I knew I could spend the rest of my life with this girl. And, and that combination, that, that, you know, affection mixed with honesty, mixed with just not putting up with any shit, that felt real and that felt durable. That felt like the kind of thing that can, that can last a lifetime. That was what I tried to create in Jenny from that point on. If, you're, if you had to balance the whole series on the head of a pin, it would be Jenny, <laughs> you know, because um, because she makes the decision. She, you know, she chooses between the worlds. Being on that fulcrum between Zot and Woody, of course, is also being on the fulcrum between the worlds, because Woody is very much rooted in our world. He's a character who's had disillusionment already. Even though as a young kid, he's already aged a bit. Those characters both represent their worlds in miniature. And, and Jenny stands right between them. So as long as I can maintain that balance, the triangle has a kind of allegorical charge to it. In the early issues, it was more of a superhero adventure, but increasingly it became about the contrast between hope and disillusionment, between our world and this other world. So I was able to take the dystopian ideas about the future that people have had over the years, and instead of turning each of those into a world, I turned each of those into a character, and they became the villains. Each, each of my villains had, was associated with a different New York skyscraper. <laughs> Deco has the Chrysler building as his head, was the, the dystopian future that we will become more and more like our machines. Zybox, perched on the top of the World Trade Center was the, the dystopian future that our machines will become more like us. And Nine Jack Nine was the dystopian future that technology would destroy us completely. I always associated Nine Jack Nine with the City Corp building, the pinstripe suit and the and like the tilted straw skimmer. Here he is with his, his eyes resembling the lights of an oncoming subway train. These were the three quiet villains, so these were the three strong villains. And then there were the loud villains, the Blotch, the De-Evolutionaries, and Bellows, and they were dystopian futures that no longer had quite as much charge to them. There was the clanking, smoke-belching, industrial revolution future of Bellows. There was the going back to the trees and turning your back on technology future of, of the Devos. And then there was the capitalism run amok future of the blotch, which gradually I decided was not necessarily as remote a future as it had been. And, and I gradually sort of upgraded him a little into a slightly more sinister villain because to me I realized that, that in fact we could be heading for his future. This is the last of the color issues. Very Ditko going through the door. Um, let's see, so we... Yes, I kind of like this spread, actually. This works all right. Again, the colors were just a little nuts. And you can see that the borders here are like these floral borders, but then they become these mechanical borders at the end, which is consistent with the theme of this character. But the whole effect, of course, is that Scott McCloud doesn't know how to choose colors. I think that's sort of the overriding message there. I, I was trying to do everything. It was very important that I just did everything. Some things, I don't know, that's kind of crazy, but... You know, I have this scene which was <laughs> influenced by Koyana Scotty of all things. I had seen Koyana Scotty. I had also seen a comic called Theodore Deathhead in Raw. So we're talking about a movie and, and a weird avant-garde French comic published in America. And somehow it was influencing me doing this superhero comic. I loved the, the idea of things getting more and more and more and more noisy and kind of exploding into this chaotic, crazy uh, scene and then be very, being very quiet. The, there was a lot going in, into the book. There was a lot going on under the surface. We, we, we knew in advance that we were going to have to end. Ten was a nice round number. And it's very much the end of that story. In between the color issues of Zod and that, that year and a half when I was sort of on the hiatus, I did the comic Destroy for Eclipse. But Destroy was actually inspired by something called Super Boxers. 
which was something by Ron Wilson, which people had criticized for being senseless violence. And I thought that sounded cool. I wanted to see a comic that was nothing but senseless violence and was disappointed to find out that it also had a plot and characters. So I thought, well, let's see if I can do a comic that's nothing but senseless violence. And I'll, I, mine will be pure. And it was nothing but two muscle-bound guys in spandex beating the shit out of each other for 32 pages. So Manhattan was a huge part of my life. And this, and human, Manhattan is a huge part of this comic. This comic is filled with New York. I would scout out locations. There's this one scene where there's a punch and Captain Maximum like goes through this Brinks truck here in Wall Street and then comes out of the, uh, let's see, is it, where is it? City Hall, comes out of City Hall and then over Washington Square, uh, out of the Flatiron Building, uh, then um, he's still going, he's going up uh, Houlihan's and the Empire State Building 42nd Street, the library, the, like the back end of the library, and then down Rockefeller Center. This is mapped. I map this precisely. That is a straight line from Wall Street. All of these, I, I planned it out so that every single one of those would be a legitimate thing for him to be flying through and destroying. Alan Moore later declared that I had invented 90s comics. And Rob Liefeld told me that he, he actually was a big fan of Destroy, so, so I, may, I may be able to take some of the blame for what happened next. But my, my whole purpose of the exercise was to get it out of my system. I wanted to, to you know, get it out so that I could move on and do other things. And the later Zod issues, I think, maybe reflected that to some degree. You know, when I, when I have whole issues of people sitting around talking about things, you know, sitting in Burger Kings in the rain and, 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 and thinking about their, you know, their parents' failed marriages. In a lot of the ways, that's because I had gotten it out of my system with Destroy. So I did 10 color issues that had this manga inflection to them, but when Zot came back a couple of years later as a black and white book, in a lot of ways, it was like I was coming home. For me, somehow, this just felt right, having looked at so much manga. You know, I was very comfortable with black and white. I was I like that page. Call of the Wild. I like the way all the monkeys look, where everybody's been turned into monkeys, so we have this police station filled with monkeys. <laughs> but meanwhile, I was also like, you know, espousing my, my artistic philosophy. There's this scene where Uncle Max here has Jenny throw a frame on the ground and just look at what the frame lands on and just think about, you know, like all of the opportunities. And I was comfortable also just doing scenes of everyday life. So like here's, this is just a kid sitting by uh, an off ramp, you know, on, on a guardrail and, um, and clouds. You know, this isn't science fiction. This is, this is the world that we live in. And increasingly I was finding the world we live in to be kind of interesting. It's an actual, you know, actual Burger King near where I lived. And I would just take time to do things like draw onion rings and, and a shake and, and a hamburger. To me, that stuff was just as interesting as the things going on in the science fiction world. I was a little of several characters. I was a little Max, I was a little Deco, I was a little Woody, I was a little Jenny. Uh, Zot, in many ways, existed more as kind of a stand-in for my father, who had died by the time I was doing the comic. Um, and he embodied my dad's optimism and kind of sunny disposition that through line of confidence from my father through me and into Zot, even though I didn't identify with Zot. I didn't feel like Zot was a stand-in for me at all, but that, but that he, he was, really, was really my father, I think, in a lot of ways. This was the last issue before Zot gets marooned. He gets marooned on Earth, and all of the rest were what we call the Earth stories, and these these are the issues that I think people remember most fondly. You know, stories just about each character in turn, Jenny and her, uh, uh, just a day of Jenny in school wishing she was anywhere else. Zot searching through New York looking for crime and being unable to find it. Here's a story about Autumn and about Jenny's mom. And it's a story about nostalgia in a lot of ways. Remembering, you know, what could have been.
of all of the issues, this is the one I, I hear from people the most about, and this is about the character of Terry and her struggles to come out as a lesbian in high school. There were a lot of readers for whom this was the first time they had ever seen issues of sexual identity dealt with in a comic. One thing to remember is that those readers, the readers who picked up on Zod at that time, they hadn't necessarily read Love and Rockets, which was you know, one of the comics that was influencing me and a lot of other people at the time. Um, Alison Bechtel was out there doing Dykes to Watch Out For. You know, it was by no means the first. The thing about Zot was Zot could sneak into places that those books didn't. And so there were comic book stores, you know, in Nebraska and Oklahoma and Utah that might carry Zot, but was, that they weren't carrying tits and clits. You know, they weren't carrying uh, Howard Cruz. So I was glad I got to, to be there for some people, for some readers, and I hear from them. From time to time I'll hear from them. And, and sometimes I'll get a pretty intense story of what was going on in their lives at the time. The whole run was um, from 84, began in 84, the color issues. And the last issue came out 90, 91, I think. So six or seven years all together, uh, spent doing Zot. I got married during it. I became an integral part of the comics community, got some nominations. Never, never a big hit. You know, if, I, if I've had one real hit, I think in my career, it's understanding comics, and that was still in the future when I finished up this series. 